Welcome back for another episode of Errant Adventures, the solo actual play podcast where stories are told at the speed of dice. With me, Steve Morrison, your game master and solo player. Now come on, let's grab the dice and see where our story goes. Welcome back for Chapter 4 of Book 1, Meridian. Last time, Sejana takes Kelevar Rin out of the final jump, slipping past Rook's notice. The two of them wait out front for Ayati to join them, but on her way out, she brushes past Rook, and he recognizes her. He follows her out of the bar and confronts her about why she's at the final jump. Ayati tries to remember her cover story and play it off, but Rook is not convinced. He grabs her, but Ayati breaks the grapple while Sejana closes on him from behind and knocks him unconscious. She leads Ayati and Rin to the transport pods, and they leave Overlook before security can stop them. On the transit, Rin gives Sejana the data and tells her about GenCorp's failed R&D for the next batch of Enelmyosin. Rin tried to take the information to the executives, but they buried the flaws and planned to continue distribution. Rin stole the comm logs and fled. Ayati clearly wants to help him get the information out, but Sejana is more measured in her response. Back on planet, Sejana and Rin take the rail back to the starport and have a heart-to-heart about the way the universe has changed since the fall of Carnapraxis. When they arrive at the starport, they find three armored individuals waiting for them, demanding Sejana surrender Rin and the data. She declines. It happens fast. All three armored mercenaries reach for the kinetic pistols strapped to their sides as Sejana shoves Rin behind a stack of containers. The sound of kinetic rounds peppering the side of the crate fills the docking bay. Drawing the Titan Service Special Laser Pistol tucked into her shoulder holster, Sejana prepares to defend herself. It's our first combat in Traveler, and one of the important things to note about this system is that it can be pretty deadly. So we'll see how this goes. Uh, Let's get into it with an initiative roll. So this can be either dexterity or intellect. And since Sejana has an intellect of 12, which is going to give her a plus two bonus, let's go ahead and use that. Here we go. Five on the dice plus two is a seven. The opposing forces are going to get... Six on the dice, but uh, these guys are just corporate thugs, so I'm going to say they do not have a bonus to their initiative. There's another roll I want to make before combat starts, and that's, did Ayati make it back to the ship before Sejana? I think it's almost certain since she was on the drift bike and not taking public transportation. So I'm going to roll my D100, and as long as I get 90 or less, it's a yes. 84. That was close, but uh, it is a yes. So I don't think these corpo mercenaries would bother her when she returned to the ship. Uh, I don't think they would have any reason to suspect that Sejana wouldn't hand over Rin once they confronted her. So I'm going to say that Ayati is safely aboard the ship. That being said, she might be available to help as the combat continues. Now that we've got our initiative sorted, let's get into this fight. Sejana and Rin are taking cover behind these containers with a Zhang Imports brand on them. Removing her Technomancer mask and sealing it to her face, Sejana pops out from beside the crate and takes a shot at one of the mercenaries with her laser pistol. So for a ranged attack, the target number is 8. Now the question is, is the one that she's aiming at within 7.5 meters? Because her laser pistol has a range of 30 meters. And if she is within short range, which is a quarter of the range of the pistol, she gets a dice modifier of plus one. So I think it's likely that the enemy that she's aiming at is within 7.5 meters. So let's roll our dice here. 25, that's a yes. Okay, so she gets that plus one to her attack. She has a laser pistol with a fancy laser sight system that also gives her a plus one, combined with her gun combat skill of plus two, and that is going to give her a total of plus four on this attack. Against a target number of eight, here we go. 
Oh, 10 on the dice, plus four is a total of 14. That's a palpable hit. Whatever effect above eight is added to damage. So that's an effect of six on top of 3d6 plus three. All told, that's 22 points of damage against this first mercenary. Now he's got a flak vest, which is uh, a piece of armor that's going to reduce five damage from this. So that takes it to 17 points of damage. I gave all three of these mercs an endurance, strength, and dexterity of seven. And damage is subtracted from endurance first, and then from either strength or dexterity. If two of the three physical stats drop to zero, a character is unconscious. If all three drop to zero, the character is dead. Sejana leans out, lines up her shot on the first mark running for cover, and pulls the trigger. A superheated laser bolt lances out and hits the mercenary in the shoulder joint where a small bit of his armpit is exposed. It punches through and the man crumples to the ground, screaming and gasping for breath. One of his lungs is badly burned by the laser, and he is out of the fight. The other two move towards cover and return fire. The short range on their auto pistols is 2.5 meters. Is she that close? I think it's unlikely. 78 is a no. Because Sejana's behind cover, they're going to take a minus two to their rolls to attack as well, which will give them both a cumulative minus one. The first Merc rolls four, minus one is definitely a miss. The second Merc is going to roll eight, but minus one is another miss. So Sejana drops one of their number with a single shot and the other two unleash their auto pistols on the crate where she's hiding. But she and Rin manage to tuck against it and the metal siding holds the kinetic rounds ricochet off. Sejana takes a deep breath and pops out from behind cover once again, drawing a bead on the second Merc. Is he within short range too? I think it's likely again. 70 is still a yes, so she is going to fire again, this time only with a plus two because this Merc is now behind cover. So here we go. Seven on the dice plus two is a nine. That's another hit with an effect of one. And our damage is going to be 19 minus five is 14. That's still enough to knock this one unconscious as well. Sejana is making short work of these mercenaries and it's a little wonder too. Don't mess with a liar, folks. This shot catches the Merc in the throat, and he gurgles and gasps, collapsing to the ground while holding the burned flesh around his neck. The final Merc takes his own shot, again at a minus one. Ten minus one is a nine, which is a hit on Sejana, with an effect of one. The auto pistol does 3d minus three. That's ten on the dice, minus three plus one is a total of eight damage. Now, here's a question to ask the Oracle, because Sejana also has a flak jacket, and I think it wouldn't be unreasonable for her to wear it while she's on a contract. Since it's basically an armored vest, she could wear it under her shirt, and it wouldn't necessarily be extremely obvious. She is a licensed bounty hunter as well, so she might be able to get around the restrictions on body armor that exist in high-tech level cities. Let's roll on the Oracle. I think it's likely she put on her flak jacket before leaving the ship this morning, and so I think it's 75 or less will be a yes. That is a 38, so she also has a subdermal armor upgrade, which I'm using to represent her deep skin, the nanofiber decompression suit that all spacers wear. Most don't have armor built in, but hers is a holdover from her days with the Imperial Special Service, so all told she has eight points of armor. Sejana takes that kinetic round to the shoulder and collapses behind the crate. Rin shouts in terror and looks almost as though he's going to rush to her side to check on her, but she writes herself and glances down at the leather coat that is now scraped open. The flak jacket underneath seems to be intact, so she pushes herself back around and fires another shot. Round number three. Can she drop this third mark? Can she go for three out of three? Since the other two were within 7.5 meters, I'm just going to say that this one is as well. 
So again, it is just plus two on our roll. Ah, uh, five plus two is a miss. So the final Merc is going to also take a shot and seven minus one is a six, so also misses. So Sejana pops out from behind cover and fires off a shot and then ducks back behind cover as a shot from the Merc ricochets off one of the crates above her head and neither of them got a good bead on the other. Now each round lasts about six seconds. So this whole firefight has so far been under 20 seconds. Would Ayati have known these mercs were out there? Would she have put herself in a position to help? I think it's unlikely. So I'm gonna roll my D100. 25 or less is a yes. I got a 51, so that's a no. All right, round four. Sejana takes another shot. Seven on the dice plus two is another hit. 3d6, that is 13 damage this time, minus five, which leaves eight. So the Merc grunts as her laser bolt punches through his exposed shoulder, and he scrambles to a different position before returning fire. 11 on the dice, minus one is a 10 total. So that's gonna be an effect of two, 3d6 damage here, oh wow, okay. So I've got two twos and a one on the damage, so it is only seven points. That could have been really bad, but once again, a round ricochets off Sejana's armored back as she ducks behind cover. Each of those hits hurt, but she'll take a little bruising over a bullet hole anytime. Round five, Sejana fires again. Six on the dice, plus two is a hit, barely. This could be it. 20 points of damage, minus five is 15. This time, the Merc, still favoring his shoulder, tries to adjust his position behind the crate he's using for cover. He pops up from behind the crate to try and draw a bead. And whether it's from years of training or preternatural sense, Sejana is waiting, laser pistol sighted in. She squeezes the trigger and a bolt fires across the distance between them, catching the Merc just below the eye. His cheekbone and face ignite in fire, and his head snaps back, body falling limply. 30 seconds. That's all it took for Carnage to fill this docking bay. Sejana pants and glances at Rin, who is hugged against one of the containers. You all right? She asks. He barely registers her words, his hands wrapped around his skull. She crouches down and says, Stay here. Don't move a muscle. Then she leaves the safety of their crate, weapon trained between the two fallen mercs, who are still breathing. Almost before she gets a handful of steps, alarms begin sounding all across the Heraklion interstellar starport. Booted feet thunder down the access ramp of the Howlin' Wolf as a Yachty and a gray-skinned Haldren emerge. The Haldren, whose fiery red hair almost entirely covers his head and face, hurries towards the closest Merc, saying, Titan's asshole, Lucille. What happened? Sejana doesn't answer as she kicks away the fallen Merc's kinetic pistol before moving on to the other one and doing the same. Once that's done, she holsters her own pistol and activates her cue, removing the data strip from her inner pocket. As it syncs with her cue, she copies all the files, encrypts them, and sequesters them from the rest of her data. Once that's done, she returns the data strip to her pocket and walks past the Haldren, giving first aid to the Merc. She grabs Rin and pulls him to his feet and says, Kalava, listen to me. Cassidy's security will be here any moment. Let me do the talking. Rin's eyes widen as he stares at her. C Cassidy and security? I have a friend, Greg Gregor. He, he works for them. Did you tell him about the data? Rin shakes his head. N no, I, I wasn't sure what to do. You don't trust this friend of yours, Sejana asks. I, I do, it's just... He waves a hand at the bodies. Corporations take data security really seriously. I didn't want to put him in danger. Sejana sighs and says, Well. We're going to have no choice but to tell them everything now. Like I said, let me do the talking. Almost as if on cue, Cassidy's security forces sweep into the docking bay, weapons raised. 
They shout for everyone to raise their hands. And with the exception of the Haldren, everyone there complies. Hello. I'm Inspector Hallow. Please state your name for the record. The room is dim and smells of stale coffee. There's a single table in the center of the room, and a small Q drone hovers above, scanning the face of the person sitting on the far side of the table. Ayari Keilana, she says. I'm the pilot of the wolf. Uh, that's the Howlin' Wolf. But we just call her the wolf. The inspector, a human in her mid-forties, studies a string of text on her cue and says, Yes, and the firefight took place in your docking bay. One dead, two in critical condition. Care to explain? The drone hovers around, and this time there's a gray-skinned Haldren sitting in the chair. He shrugs. I heard the ruckus and ran outside. Saw the bodies and tried to help one. That's all I know. The inspector leans forward. Mr. Stargleam, you were carrying a kinetic pistol on your person when we found you. Are you suggesting you were not involved in the incident? He grunts and says, The only ones involved in the incident, as you called it, were those three corporate thugs and our liar. She uses a laser pistol. Titan service special, I believe. I didn't get a good look at the other two, but I'm assuming you already know they were downed by laser fire. And let me tell you this. I don't need to have been involved to know that they came into our docking bay and they started trouble. The drone rotates and this time Calavar Wren is sitting in the chair, staring at the table. The inspector dismisses her quick screen and says, Calavar Wren, a former information systems analyst for GenCorp. You've been accused of stealing proprietary data from their offices on Brenghold. I'm just looking for your side of the story. Please, tell me what happened. Rin continues staring at the table. I, I, I would like to speak with my lawyer. Until then, I've got nothing to say. The inspector leans back in her chair and says, This will be much easier if you cooperate. The drone rotates... And Sejana Luchel sits in the chair, staring back into the inspector's eyes. I have every intention of cooperating, she says. Then she points to the data strip on the table. Let's open that and see what it says. The inspector shakes her head. GenCorp has filed a claim on that data strip, saying it has proprietary information. Can't open it and read it until that is resolved by a mediator. I'm assuming that's why you gunned down three men while you were fleeing the city? Sejana smiles, a cold, sharp look, and says, I wasn't fleeing. I was returning to my ship with important information while engaging in a legally authorized contract. They drew and fired first. I was merely defending myself. Easy for you to say. You're still standing. The two who are still alive remain in critical condition and haven't recovered enough to make a statement. The inspector waves a hand and a quick screen activates on the table, with stills of the two men being treated. I've been informed they work for GenCorp, which is who signed your contract. If they were assisting you in fulfilling your mission, which was to recover Mr. Rin and the stolen information, why exactly did it devolve into a gunfight unless you provoked them? Sejana folds her arms and says, There are a thousand surveillance drones in the HIS, including in every docking bay. You've reviewed the footage, and you know they fired first. As a licensed recovery specialist, I have legal authority to defend myself. Unless you have some further cause to hold me, I think my crew and I are free to go. Your crew? Inspector Hallow says, looking pointedly back at her cue. I show here that Einar Stargleam is captain of the Howlin Wolf, a merchant vessel owned by Zhang Imports. Mr. Zhang has been contacted as well. Nowhere in the records, or in fact the testimony of the others, do I find evidence of you being in charge. She looks at Sejana and says, I don't believe you have a crew, Miss Luchelle. I believe you are a solitary gun for hire who has taken up residence on that merchant ship. And in the course of your activities, 
you have placed them in the line of fire. Sejana nods once and says, Are you holding me and the others here under charges, or are we free to go? I have a report of you, Mr. Wren, and Miss Kailana being involved in a scuffle this morning outside the final jump. Inspector Hallow calls up a still image of Sejana standing over the unconscious rook. Station surveillance shows you beating a man senseless and fleeing the scene. Care to explain that? Sejana smiles again and points to the image. A convenient still that ignores once again the facts. This fellow assaulted my friend while she was leaving the final jump. I moved to assist. In the course of disengaging him from my friend, I knocked him unconscious. Using the phrase, beat senseless, is grossly misleading. But you know that. She leans forward. My question for you, Inspector, is why you're so determined to blame me. It's common for those in Kassak to dislike liars, but this feels slightly more personal. Have I wronged you in another life? Inspector Hallow studies her for a long moment, and then dismisses the projection from her cue. Leaning back in her own chair, she says, Almost before I got the call about the incident at your docking bay, word comes down from on high that Gen Corp has a vested interest in this case, and proprietary information is involved. Now I find that three Gen Corp triggermen have been gunned down by a highly decorated former member of the Imperial Special Service turned liar, just hours after a known information broker is knocked unconscious by that same liar. It leads to a lot of questions. Why was Gen Corp so fast to respond? What part are you playing in this? And what is Gen Corp hiding? Sejana glances at the data strip. The answers you're seeking are right there. You just have to listen to the logs. Shaking her head again, the inspector says, Gen Corp has already laid claim to it and invoked the Corporate Secrets Act. A foolish piece of legislation, if you ask me. If I unseal that and listen to it, I'm opening Cassidy and security to liability, and Gen Corp is particularly litigious. She holds up a hand as Sejana opens her mouth to speak. And if you confess to knowing or having listened to the contents of the device, I am legally obligated to hold you until their inquiry is satisfied. What a pretty web we've wrapped around ourselves. Sejana says, I understand. Am I free to go? The inspector nods and says, You and the crew of the Howlin' Wolf will be released. Mr. Rin, however, will be staying with us. He is wanted on theft of corporate property. Sejana reaches over and picks up the data strip. As per my contract, this isn't to leave my presence until I hand it over to a verified GenCorp representative. I could make the same argument for Mr. Rin, but I suspect he might be safer in your custody. GenCorp has requested the data strip be remanded to our custody, unopened, until they arrive. I can show you the appropriate documentation. Inspector Hallow grimaces. I read your file, at least the parts of it I could find. I doubt you'd be holding on to this if it weren't important, but they've got this one tied up in a neat bow. She stands and holds out a hand. Sejana places the data strip there. Hallow closes her fingers around it and says, I'm sorry. I wish there was more I could do. I suggest you take the loss and make yourself scarce in system for a little while. If you're lucky, once they have their data back, they'll consider the matter closed. I appreciate your advice. Inspector. Sejana rises as well. I'm ready to be released now. What was that all about? Einar Stargleam grumbles as they leave Cassidy's security headquarters. Are they keeping Rin? Ayati asks. Yes, but he'll be safer in their custody. At least until Gencorp shows up. Sejana sighs and activates her cue, beginning to scroll through a list of contacts. What are we going to do? Ayati hurries to stay by her side. Sejana shakes her head. We're not going to do anything. The inspector was right. Going up against a corporation is dangerous. I'll pack up my stuff and leave the ship as soon as we get back. Then I'm going to find a way to get this information out into the world. Maybe we should wait to discuss this until we're back on the ship. Einar says, glancing around. There's too much surveillance around here. Sejana nods and sends out a call for a drift car. 
Within moments, one settles onto the street, and they climb in. They sit in silence as the drift car returns them to their docking bay. As they board the ship, Einer says, What's the likelihood of more Gen Corp thugs showing up? That's why I'm leaving, Sejana says. It's likely, if they think I made a copy of the data. I'd recommend speeding up your departure and leaving today. I don't think they'll come after you once I've left. Anyways, I plan to keep them busy. They enter the main communal area of the Howland Wolf, and Ainur crosses to a small station, where he begins heating water. Sejana heads towards her quarters, and Ayati follows behind, saying, We're not going to let you do this on your own. You need help. Sejana stops and says, I appreciate your courage, but I'll be better on my own. Trust me. It's not about that, Lushale. It's about doing what's right. We've all used those tabs for jump sickness. If we don't do anything, I don't know that I'll ever be able to take another one without being afraid of getting sick. She looks back at Einer. Cap, we gotta help, right? I mean this in the kindest of terms, Sejana interjects before the Haldren can reply. Corporate intrigue and bloodshed aren't your game. Ayari, you're a phenomenal pilot, and Einar, you have a good sense for business. That's why you work the jobs you do. Let me do my job. Einar picks up a small grinder and pours a handful of seeds into it. Turning the handle, he grunts over the sound of the seeds being ground into powder. I've worked for corporations, he says. I know the games they play. And I think Ayati's right. I'm not going to be able to sleep at night if I don't do anything. Sejana frowns. And what do you suggest doing? You did make a copy, correct? Sejana nods once. We distribute it to the news outlets. Let them shine a light on what's happening. Rin already tried that, Sejana says, folding her arms. They won't publish it without corroboration. How do you suggest doing that? Ainur pours the grounds into a small contraption attached to the water canister and grins. I have no idea, but I assume you have a plan. So my question for you is, how can we help? Sejana looks over at Ayati and then back to Einar. Are you sure you want to do this? This isn't a tense contract negotiation. I've crossed GenCorp once, and I'm going to do it again before this is over. They're not going to take kindly to it. They'll send more goons next time. Well, I'm damn sure, Ayati says. Einar chuckles and says, I appreciate you trying to protect us, but I fought in the regular war. Ayati was a scout pilot. Neither of us is unaccustomed to danger. Sejana sighs and says, Very well. I reached out to a reporter I've had interactions with after Rin told me he tried to contact the media. She confirmed that she would need a second source of info before she could start running anything. Entering a command on her queue, she gestures for the data to display on the central quick screen hanging in the common room. It shows a sea of satellites orbiting Felicia, the fourth planet in the system and home to Gen Corp's headquarters. One is highlighted, and with a gesture, the screen magnifies to show it. This is a comm substation, owned by a shell company belonging to Gen Corp. It contains backups of all comm logs transmitted through the system. Sejana changes the display to a blueprint. If we want a confirmation of the comm logs we have, We need to infiltrate this station and transmit those codes to my contact. Seems easy enough, Einar says. What's the problem? The knife of a smile returns to Sejana's face. Because it contains records of everything GenCorp does, security is top of the line. She points to the blueprint. There are four drones attached to the exterior that can detach and defend from approaching ships. There's only one airlock and only a ship with authorization can approach and dock. Once we're on the station, there are only six security officers, they work two to a shift, but to access any of the data cores, both security officers must insert a key and enter an activation code. Otherwise, all of the cores are purged. Einar grunts. Is this the only way? It's the fastest, Sejana says. The alternatives are infiltrating the main HQ, and locating the deep cores buried behind hundreds of tons of duracrete, or kidnapping an executive. This option has fewer complications. 
Hey, Yachty, spool up the astro drive and get the wolf in the air. Einer commands. I'll find us something to pick up on Felicia, so we've got a reason to be heading that way. We'll have a few hours in transit to plan. Will that be enough? Sejana nods. It will have to be. She turns and starts to head towards her quarters, then stops. Thank you for the help. Ayati and Einar both nod. Then Ayati heads for the cockpit while Einar activates his cue and takes a long sip from his drink as strings of information scroll across his feed. Within the hour, the Howlin' Wolf lifts off from its berth in the Heraklion interstellar spaceport and accelerates towards space. In her quarters, Sejana has laid out her gear and is looking at it thoughtfully while reviewing the satellite blueprints. Expanding the blueprint, she studies a section of the station that is most likely used for storage. She nods and says, Hmm, that just might work. Thanks for listening to Errant Adventures. If you enjoyed the show, please spread the word. And if you want to support the show directly, leave me a review or support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash errantadventures. You can also buy me a coffee at ko-fi.com slash errantadventures. If you want to interact with me, my handle on all the socials is at errantsolopod. Or you can email me at errantsolopod at gmail.com. I also post short fiction and campaign-related materials on my website, errantadventurespod.com. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you in the deep, liars. Liars.